Welcome to the 15th Clinton Global Initiative University meeting. Please take your seats and silence your cell phones. We are so proud and excited that CGI University will be coming back in person at Vanderbilt University. CGIU. 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 I think I should spend the rest of my life trying to give other people the same set of life chances that I had. This program has created more and more opportunities to not only make a commitment, but to meet others and to figure out what you can do to make a difference. You all have one big thing in common, and that's the desire to make the world a better place. You all refuse to accept the status quo, and that's definitely the camp that I want to be in. One of the things that we can all do is more easily come up with new ideas. And that's basically what CGIU does. You guys come up with all these amazing ideas. The audacity of thought, I mean, it's really incredible to see the different commitments that people have made. I walked into a room with a thousand young people from all over the world who didn't wait for someone to invite them to the table, but truly said, here's the thing that I'm going to do and here's the level of impact that I can have. The students have such a passion for their commitments to action. My name is Deja Powell from Cornell University. Akshay Kamath, and I'm from Rutgers University. My partners and I started Enterprise Young to address the pervasive unemployment in Sub-Saharan Africa. To address the problem of healthy food access and poor school quality. To address the global problem of child malnutrition. The physical and emotional difficulties experienced by the migrant workers in the United Arab Emirates. This is intimidating. You are an incredible group of people. I am going to be the dumbest person in the room tonight. That definitely deserves a round of applause. Thank you. When I've served as a commitment mentor, every time I come, I just leave inspired and wanting to do more and really make a difference. And I feel empowered to do that because of coming to CGIU. You meet such amazing people who've done such amazing work in their respective communities. It just like increases your passion to actually do more. This is the greatest time to be young and involved. It takes a community of young people to make the world a better place. Look for people like you who are also trying to do something good. I want to tell you, it's not easy, but don't give up. As long as you're patient, persistent, and passionate about your goal, then you'll be able to accomplish more than what you can imagine. Be grateful for the opportunities you've had, and then go and work with those who don't have your opportunities to create the future you want to live in. Find something you care deeply about, that you're excited about, and be active. And all of you help give me the faith to get up tomorrow and again choose to be optimistic. If you add up the collective endeavors represented by the potential in this room, it would move the world. Please welcome the Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, Daniel Deermeyer. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Vanderbilt University, it's my great honor to be the first to welcome you tonight to our campus, to our city, and most importantly, to our community, which extends far beyond these rooms and our time together this weekend. To President Bill Clinton, Secretary Hillary Clinton, Chelsea Clinton, and everyone at the Clinton Foundation, thank you for giving Vanderbilt the opportunity to serve as this year's host for CGIU. To partner with this incredible cohort of young leaders and innovators from around the world in their commitments to positive change. And to help launch hundreds of unique journeys that have the potential to lead us all toward a better world. In the life of a university, this is an extraordinary moment for us. Because in 2023, it comes at a momentous time. Vanderbilt's story actually began in 1873, 150 years ago, in the aftermath of the Civil War, 
when our founder, Cornelius Vanderbilt, made what was then the largest charitable gift in America's history. That gift helped realize the vision of, of our founders who believed the best way to move our troubled society forward was to build at the heart of our embattled nation a great university, a place where people and ideas could work together for the common good. This year, as we celebrate our sesquicentennial, Vanderbilt, now a world-renowned institution for discovery and innovation, that vision of our early founders remains. Today, the vision has only expanded. For now, our society is a global one, and addressing the complexity of its challenges requires great minds working together like never before. It requires people from diverse backgrounds and disciplines sharing bold ideas in open forests where they can be rigorously discussed, tested, and refined, where they can be nourished and developed into an actionable solution that our world needs. And these great minds need not always agree. Indeed, in the highly polarized and often hostile political and cultural atmosphere of, of today, universities might be the last best place where people can learn to converse and cooperate with those who see things differently. And that quality is the key to the fundamental principles of a university, to provide transformative education and conduct path-breaking research. At Vanderbilt, we want our students to freely argue their convictions while upholding civil discourse as a core value. We encourage them to understand first and evaluate later because we know that real innovation requires open inquiry, divergent thought, and that today's world needs leaders who have not only the courage to speak, but to listen and learn from one another. At Vanderbilt, we believe that it is our social responsibility as an institution of higher learning to always be a haven for these ideals. And we're tremendously proud to provide the forum for immense discovery that will take place in the coming days here at CGIU. And we are proud to do so in partnership with our hometown of Nashville, which has a rich history as the intellectual hub of the civil rights era and American culture and aesthetic movements and is now a burgeoning global hub of creativity and innovation. And we're also looking forward to the role that we will play after this weekend to the many relationships and collaborations that will form here and the good work that will be engendered. If the great university that Vanderbilt's found, founders envisioned in 1873 was born distinctly of its place and its time, then the great university of today will look very much like what we'll see during this re weekend at CGIU a community of varied and lively minds brought together in common purpose to address the most pressing challenges of our day. And now, it's my great honor to welcome to the stage the 42nd President of the United States and founder and board chair of the Clinton Foundation, President Bill Clinton. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Dearmar. That was a very fine set of remarks, and I, I'm very grateful that Vanderbilt is hosting us. This is the first time since 2018 when we've been able to meet in person because of the COVID epidemic, and uh, I think it's fitting because the last place we held an in-person CGIU 
was at the University of Chicago when Chancellor Dearmar was the provost there. <laughs> so when I'm trying to get up a meeting, I just try to figure out where he is, and he's on over there. I also want to say uh, to all of you who are here how grateful I am. And uh, <clears throat> there are about 150 more of you who I hope will be here tomorrow. So tonight, after we do all these things, we were going to take a big picture of, a, you know, kind of a class photo. But I think it'll be a bummer if, for the 150 that are trying to get here through the weather. And so I, <clears throat> I checked at the weather and they said, we think everybody will be here tomorrow, so don't leave yet. We gotta take our picture tomorrow. <laughs> The theme of this year's CJIU is homecoming, strengthening community leadership and action. Like all our meetings and all homecomings, fundamentally, the weekend is a celebration of community. What it means to be a community, uh, is it an inclusive or an exclusive community? Is it a uniting or a dividing community? Is it improving all of our ability to fulfill our potential or trying to pick winners and losers? I could fill this beautiful auditorium with the social science studies which document in a thousand ways that diverse groups committed to common goals make better decisions than homogenous groups are lone geniuses. And yet, <clears throat> we still seem to be toying, not just in the United States, but all over the world with this idea that somehow the only thing that matters is to win a war of asserting your cultural dominance and that you should be very threatened by people who are different from you. I think that's not true. And I think that you will prove here again that our differences are profoundly important but they only really work when our common humanity matters more. And that frees us to pursue things together, to be honest with one another, and to bring out the best in everyone. 63 years ago here in Nashville, college students same age as our CGIU commitment makers, including my great friend, the late John Lewis, and his colleague, Diane Nash, desegregated lunch counters. They were at downtown department stores where the counters had been segregated. And what they did sparked sit-in protests that spread throughout America. At one point during all this, Diane, about your age, asked the mayor of this city on the steps of City Hall, do you feel it's wrong to discriminate against a person solely on the basis of their race or color? And to credit the mayor, he said no. And it changed everything for them. Today we celebrate a community in CGI almost defined by its diversity. We have people here from all over the world, we have people from hundreds of countries and hundreds of universities. 
who are here to make common cause against the great challenges of our time and to seize the great opportunities of our time and to do it together to prove that the best way to celebrate our differences is to use our different strengths to reach a common good. You know, let's see, the, our, our community now, the CGI community, includes over 11,800 students from more than 160 countries and 1,800 institutions of higher education. You're about to make it all bigger. But the most important thing is you're about to make it better. So it's really important what you're going to accomplish in the year here because we're still having in America and around the world these great battles where people think the most important thing is that I get to make you do what I want. I win the culture war by putting the squeeze on you and by being very gifted at painting you into a two-dimensional cartoon instead of a three-dimensional person. But what works best is releasing the three-dimensional person that's inside all of us, breaking the two-dimensional cartoon and empowering us to do things that we never could have imagined. At one of our CGIs not very long ago, I was asked, we were in Berkeley, California, I remember, with John Lewis, and I was asked, uh, what advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Today, if you ask me that, I might say, find the fountain of youth and do it in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> but I gave a serious answer. I said, I believe, based on all these years that have elapsed, that I would say the most important thing is to never disempower yourself. And don't waste your life trying to disempower other people. Try to empower people. Try to make them believe they can do more than they can. And that's basically what CGIU is. I think you'll have a good time. I hope you do. And I think you'll meet friends that you'll keep a long time. And I think you'll be living proof that this divisive climate that is gripping the world over is, I hope, a passing thing. Because any illusion that we are better because we can break someone else is a passing thing. Any illusion that we can make our future better or our children's future better by choosing divisive tribalism over inclusive tribalism is a passing thing. I've reached the age when it seems quite a waste of time to focus on passing things. So I'm glad you're here. I hope you have a great time, and I hope you'll never disempower yourself. Now, before we begin our panel, uh, well, Hillary's doing a conversation, and then Chelsea is, so we have two things. I want to give you an example of what I think is the best of CGIU, because we try every year to bring back people who've made commitments and done their dead level best to keep them to give us kind of an update on what's happened. So I'd like to call to the stage 
Biz Herman and Francesca Rileyson to come up and tell us about what progress they have made. Hi, everyone. My name is Biz Herman, and I was part of the first CGIU class all the way back in 2008. I rem thank you. I remember well that inaugural meeting at Tulane University and the feeling of excitement that I had to be a part of this new initiative that CGI had to bring together college students like yourselves to come up with innovative solutions to global problems. At the time, I was an undergrad at Tufts University where I was working with my CGIU partners on issues of social discord um, around youth violence in Boston. And so our site CGIU commitment sought to build awareness and civic engagement uh, using photography, documentary filmmaking, and public discourse on issues of social violence in Boston. Being part of CGIU and this global network of commitment makers has had a profound impact on my personal and my professional growth. The people that I've met, the resources that I've had access to, and the mutual sense of meaning and purpose have had a profound impact on my work to this day. Since then, I've earned my doctorate in political science, and I'm now a postdoctoral fellow at Perry World House at the University of Pennsylvania. I've... <laughs> My research examines how trauma and violence shape individuals, communities, and countries. My research in Bangladesh as a Fulbright Fellow taught me the importance of seeing broader perspectives and alternative perspectives, key CGIU tenants. I'm also an Emmy-nominated photojournalist. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> My interest in the complexities of human rights and peace have driven my passion for human-centered research, storytelling, and visual journalism. I just can't tell you, both my research and my photojournalism work have been a direct outgrowth of my CGIU commitment 15 years ago. 15 years ago. <laughs> I know that your own lives and stories will be just as impacted by your CGIU experiences as mine was then. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and uh, Manona from Madagascar. I am Francesca Rolison, CGIU class of 2017, and since 22, a CGIU mentor. I realized when I first came to college in the United States that growing up, I was a um, victim of emotional abuse, but I didn't know it. In Madagascar, there's roughly 80% of children who experience some form of abuse, from yelling, name-calling, diminishing of self-worth, invalidation of emotions. And the impact on people's dignity, self-esteem, and mental health is just incalculable. And when I shared my personal journey, the video went viral. And that's when I realized that I was not alone and that emotional abuse is an visible global pandemic that we don't talk about. So my CGIU commitment in 2017 sought to break that intergenerational cycle of trauma by providing children and young adults with the emotional tools so that they can um, uh, look out for and combat abu abuse at its root and mainly build healthier relationships. Today, UMENA, which is my commitment, is a global youth-led movement that is breaking the cycle through community and uh, school um, training, prevent preventative uh, social-emotional education, and community support. Breaking the cycle means happier, healthier, and uh, thriving children, families, and communities. And with our 250 ambassadors that are working all around the world, and I know that they are watching right now. Together, we've been able to um, engage with over 1,500 students. We worked with 20 organizations, and through our online campaign of awareness, we reached over 1 million people. And our... <laughs> Um, 
our reach and impact would not have been possible without the incredible support from the CGIU as well as the, um, the advisors from the global network. And I am just excited and honored to be able to give back to this community as a mentor. And uh, to be here today to see the amazing and impactful commitments that you all will make. Thank you. Hey there, my name is Joel Burbell. I'm a content creator, but also a medical student by day. I create content to bust medical myths, tell untold stories, and share my day-to-day -day life as a medical student because it's a pretty crazy journey. A little about me. Both my parents are immigrants from Ghana, West Africa, but I grew up in a small town north of Seattle, then went to the East Coast to graduate college from Yale and came back to the West Coast for medical school. Fun fact, I was actually the first black student at my medical school. I served as student body president and I run a mentorship program here. I like to keep myself busy. When I was younger, I was inspired to enter into the medical field after my grandma passed away from a preventable malaria infection. Since then, understanding racial and health inequities has been a driving passion of mine. It's largely what I talk about on TikTok and the things that have happened to me since using social media have been incredible. TikTok chose me as one of 100 Black creatives, selected me for the inaugural Discover list, and named me as a 2021 Voice for Change. I've been on Good Morning America, spoken on NPR, I'm a headline speaker at South by Southwest, but it's the comments from people that say my videos have been life-saving that truly mean the most to me. One follower told me that they got their melanoma diagnosed because of a video I made, and others have said they feel seen for the first time because of my videos. But most importantly, I get to be the representation that I never saw for myself in media and medicine, and that drives me every day. Please welcome the 67th U.S. Secretary of State, Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> I cannot tell you how happy I am to be here for a million reasons, most of which is to have gotten out of the air, <laughs> to be on somewhat solid ground. Uh, we have a lot of, um, of the CGIU participants literally driving, rescheduling their flights, trying to get here. I think uh, Bill mentioned like over 150. So it is great to kick off the CGIU uh, and to listen to some of those who have participated in years past with the commitments that they <clears throat> have made. And it's a special pleasure to be here at Vanderbilt. Um, this is such a great university and I am expressing gratitude to the administration, to the staff, to the faculty, and to the students of Vanderbilt who are hosting us this weekend. So let's give Vanderbilt a big round of applause. I always look forward to this uh, weekend. As you've heard, we haven't met in person since 2018. Uh, we did continue over Zoom, which was okay, but not as great as it could have been because people couldn't be together, which is, I think, the magic of uh, CGIU, meeting people. And we can once again gather in person to talk about some of these tough challenges. For your information, we have about uh, 787 students, 338 universities represented, 92 countries, and 42 states. So, and we're going to be talking about everything from climate change and health equity to education uh, to reproductive rights, um, all of the ideas and passions that you bring. Uh, to CGIU, and I can't wait to hear uh, about your perspectives and ideas. But right now, I have an enormous pleasure uh, because our first uh, uh, spotlight speaker is someone I've gotten to know and admire and really 
uh, am proud of. Uh, so please join me in welcoming my good friend, uh, Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> Happy to see you. Happy, to, so happy to see you. Same here. Yeah, I, I mean, this is an amazing group. I, I know you've been uh, briefed um, about where they come from and who they are, and these are your kind of people, Pete. These are people who That's like it. to get things done and make a difference. And let's start off with the fact that you were elected mayor of South Bend, Indiana at the age of 29. Uh, just a few years older than most of the audience here. So what inspired you to run for office at such a young age? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. This is a great honor. I've, I've really been looking forward to it. And, and you're right, I got to know a, a few of the students on the way out here, and uh, I'm, I'm so excited about what they're up to. Um, so I come from South Bend, Indiana, which is best known for, for the University of Notre Dame being there, but it's actually an industrial city. It was built around the Studebaker Auto Company. It was a company town for a company that stopped existing in the 1960s. And even though that happened decades before I was born, I grew up still in the shadow of that. The city was still kind of picking its way out of that, lost tens of thousands of people and wasn't quite sure what it was going to be. Right around the time I entered the race for mayor, there was a, a national story about American so-called dying cities, and we were one of them. And the article about all the reasons that our city was supposedly dying focused on the fact that there were a lot of statistics showing young people were leaving at a troubling rate because of a perceived lack of opportunity. And so I saw that not only was my hometown that I cared about struggling, but that struggle, it turned out, specifically had to do with the, the presence or, or the loss of young people. And I thought, well, I'm young. I care about this city. <laughs> and, and I started getting together with some of my old friends who, like me, had assumed that success meant, meant leaving, but would come back together around Thanksgiving or, or holidays or, or whatever the occasion, get together over a drink, and say, you know, what's going on? What would it take for our city to come back? And Somewhere along the line in those conversations, the light bulb went off that, that any time you find yourself repeatedly using sentences that begin with, why don't they? Why don't they? Right. Why don't they stop thinking Studebaker's going to come back? Why don't they bring some life to downtown? Why, why don't they reanimate the, 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 the social life of the city? You start thinking, well, why don't I? Why don't we? Yeah, right? We, right? We could do something about that. Right. And then we did, and it worked. Yeah. That was the amazing thing. I, we, we had no idea when I when I set out to run for mayor, that, that we would succeed. I was up against uh, much better known names in, in local politics. But I also found that, that an older generation of people, I think really sympathized with a, a wave of young people who said that we wanted to shape the trajectory of our city differently. And I'm very proud to say that that team we put together over the course of, of that eight years that I was mayor, really did create what, what I would call the comeback decade mm. of our city, changed the trajectory on everything from population to economics, and uh, just built my faith in, in what people can, can do when you get together and, and say, why don't I? Well, I, I think that's such an important point because it's true that people often see a problem and want somebody to fix it and don't think that, hey, I could be that somebody, and who can I get to work with in order to make that happen? So this is an audience of uh, young leaders and entrepreneurs, uh, many of whom are in their uh, early uh, and mid-20s. And when we think about the issues that they're uh, confronting uh, today, you still have that same sense of optimism uh, that if people decide that they can get together and find common cause and work on a problem, that something good can happen because there's a lot of discouragement out there. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people who are kind of overwhelmed by the steady barrage of bad stories and scapegoating and finger pointing. So how do you think about this time, which is a little more challenging uh, for people to find their place? There's no question. The, the level of negativity and, and the mechanisms that exist to create a, 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 an amplification of that negativity, 
uh, are, I think, in, in, in certain ways unprecedented, in other ways probably par for the course when you're trying to do big things. But they, they have collided over the heads of, I think, the generation now with the most at stake. Because uh, you know, your generation will be called to solve some of the toughest things that, that humanity's ever faced, which will require some of the most successful, extensive, and disciplined coordinated action that humanity's ever attempted. So that's certainly true when it comes to the climate challenge, just to choose one. And so we, on some level, we have no choice but to, to, to push away that negativity. Uh, and also, I think that, that there have been things, even in this very challenging time, that have demonstrated what, what can be done. And I, I would point, uh, at risk of, of, of sounding a little immodest, to what we're doing in this administration right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, in two years, uh, the, the most, some of the most significant industrial policy of, uh, of, of the post-war era, um, an infrastructure bill that obviously I'm very proud to, to be working on and excited about, uh, that's, that's putting the, the most investment into uh, things from, from highways and, and, and bridges to, to ports and airports since, since the Eisenhower years. Um, these things are being achieved not just by uh, President Biden, though I'm very proud to, to be working under his leadership, not just by our administration, though I'm proud to be part of it, not just by elected officials, but by a country that has in fact managed to coalesce into certain majorities, not just congressional majorities, but national majorities, to get some of this big stuff done. Uh, I, I was just, just today, I was in Glendale, uh, Kentucky, uh, a couple hours from here, out of, uh, oh, somebody knows Glendale, all right, nice. So you know how, how your home is, is gonna be transformed by, by this uh, facility uh, creating uh, electric batteries or for batteries for electric vehicles. Uh, thousands of jobs. And uh, there are thousands of jobs right now just building this thing. Uh, I mean, it is enormous, millions of square feet. And then of course there'll be thousands of good paying jobs doing the actual work. The very same kind of good paying jobs that propelled the arrival of, of my hometown 100 years ago and, and put so many people into the middle class. And nobody there was talking about the politics of EVs and, and nobody was talking about red and blue, the local officials. I think most of them were probably Republican. I don't know, it didn't come up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so these, the, these things are possible even in this moment, which is good news because they're important, especially in this moment. Yeah. Well, I know a little bit about uh, receiving criticism and backlash, <laughs> just a little, um, and how often uh, partisanship gets in the way of you know, doing what needs to be done or even telling the real story about yeah. what is happening. And, Look, there's been a lot of misinformation and confusion about this terrible uh, derailment in East Palestine, uh, Ohio. And, and, you know, I, because I was in the Senate for eight years and follow a lot of this, I kind of know what really happened, but uh, that doesn't uh, help when there's an alternative narrative that uh, is really trying to uh, create problems instead of solve the real uh, challenges. Can you tell us a bit about who does what when there is a derailment uh, like this and how we can prevent that from happening and you know, really what's going on now? Yeah, uh, so uh, just a few days ago, I was in East Palestine, Ohio, and, and it's a community of people who, through no fault of their own, have had their lives turned upside down by this, this terrible situation. A train derailed, uh, it was uh, carrying a number of hazardous materials, uh, some of which uh, had to be burned off in order to prevent explosions that would have been even more devastating. And they're asking questions, is my home safe? Is the air safe? Is the water safe? Is the soil safe? And uh, what hasn't come through in some of the media narratives is that uh, there was a federal response from the first hours. Uh, uh, not just my department that was on the ground, but uh, importantly, uh, the EPA, which really takes the lead on things like holding Norfolk Southern accountable for this cleanup and the testing that, that's needed. Um, and, uh, and more recently, FEMA and, and other agencies. When you have a disaster like that, the, the uh, National Transportation Safety Board comes in. NTSB is independent from my department for a very good reason, which is they need uh, a, an independent way to look and make recommendations on everything that could have been different, what the company could have done differently, but also what the government could have done differently so we can make better policies. Our role uh, includes the policy framework for making sure these things don't happen again. 
And so what, what I found on the ground was uh, not only the need to, to make sure that these residents are getting their questions answered and getting the support they deserve, but also we've got to honor them and every community that sits along a railway line. And, and so many of you may have found uh, where you live, you look at those tank cars a little bit differently when they move uh, on a train through your, your hometown or your neighborhood after what happened uh, to make sure we're raising the bar uh, on, on railway safety, which is not an easy thing to do because right. frankly, there's a very powerful lobby that has been very effective at e even watering down some of the things that were put in over, over the years. But I also think there's a moment here uh, because there will be a, a very clear moment of truth among people who have uh, gotten involved and gotten on television to talk about this issue uh, that will demonstrate, I think, whether they are prepared to honor the people of East Palestine or whether they were just there to use them. Right. Because we're about to move forward on a lot of reforms. Yep. Uh, some things we were working on the whole time. Other things there's new energy to do more with around uh, a higher standard for the strength of those tank cars so that they're less likely to, to puncture or, or, or be damaged. Uh, around the, um, the accountability for railroad companies, which sometimes pay a uh, legal maximum of a six-figure fine, which doesn't mean much to a multi-billion dollar company. We can change some of that. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it we're doing on our own, but some of it requires Congress to help us change. So mm -hmm. this is a put up or shut up moment <laughs> for a good. lot of people yeah. who were part of, of, of the conversation. And I will say to their credit, I've seen people on both sides of the aisle mm -hmm. working on this issue. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to work with them to get real things done. And the rest is politics. And you know, one thing I'm, I'm not gonna do is, is uh, complain about any frustration associated with coming to an agency and having work to do every day and finding that you're, uh, you're dealing sometimes with a noise machine that seems to have little to do with your day-to-day -day work and a lot to do with perceptions about your uh, real or perceived role in presidential politics. I, it would be very indecent of me to complain of that sitting next to you. Uh, so uh, the, the real important thing is just what can we get done? Well, I think that's exactly the right attitude uh, to take. I do think, uh, and I've appreciated uh, you're uh, setting the record straight and firing back at some of the disinformation because in this fast moving information ecosystem, uh, people hear things and, and it's kind of here today, gone in a minute and, and they don't know what to believe. There's so much uh, room for confusion. Uh, so I think it's important to stay focused on the job but also when appropriate to respond and you're, uh, you're excellent at doing that. You know, when you read about your uh, biography, your accomplishments, um, you're often described as a trailblazer. Uh, you are the first uh, openly gay cabinet member. You're the youngest. Um, person to ever hold uh, the office of Secretary of Transportation. You're one of the youngest uh, people to make a serious bid for the presidency. So there's no doubt that um, along the way, being the first often requires knocking down some barriers, some misconceptions. You know, what message do you want to convey to our CGIU students about uh, forging your own path, being true to yourself, because you went through a lot of soul searching and you know you were in uh, the uh, army, you served in Afghanistan, uh, uh, you were incredibly successful uh, as a student, you were a Rhodes Scholar, but then you also had to come to grips with who you actually were and how you wanted to live your life. And it was courageous, um, and yet it's also a good reminder that as we sit here in this beautiful auditorium at this great university, there are millions of people around the world grappling with some of the very same issues and questions you did. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm, I'm humbled to have a word like trailblazer used when I'm sitting next to you and knowing all the cracks you put in that glass ceiling. Um, and. Uh, um, but I am mindful of, of how things changed for me when, when I was able to, to come forward and, and, and realize that, that it was time to, to um, be who I was and let the consequences be what they might. Uh, what happened was um, 
I uh, was deployed to Afghanistan. Uh, for the record, I should say it was a uh, Navy reservist, but I, they were having me doing Army stuff. Yeah. Um, kind of how it works sometimes in the military. And uh, I was, one of the things you do when you go on a deployment is you sit down and you write a letter, just in case. And I was writing that letter. I was already a sitting mayor at the time and, and had a great life, a great house and great friends and, and meaningful work. Um, but as I was going through that process of writing the letter that, that my loved ones might have to open if I didn't come back, um, one of the things I had to think about was that at that age, I had no idea what it was like to be in love. And I thought for all the things I've been able to do and see and, and experience, uh, that was not a tenable situation. And that if, if I did come back, okay, which thank God I did, uh, I would do something about that and, and get on with that part of my life. But what that meant was putting an awful lot at risk because the, through those, those years, uh, my career consisted of two things. And I don't know which one was less friendly <laughs> to, to being gay when I got into it. One was military service, which was still, the, at the time I first joined, um, a matter of policy that you'd be fired if you were openly gay. And the other was uh, politic, elected politic, public service in Indiana, which is not known for being the most LGBTQ friendly uh, state. Matter of fact, this was during the Pence administration back in Indiana. But I knew that it was just time. And what I found, and I guess the thing that I hope anyone wrestling with anything remotely like that today knows, is that uh, that what seemed then like a threat or an obstacle became a huge part of what I actually had to offer. What I mean by that is not only that, that it turned out I was able to get reelected as mayor after coming out in an election year and that I was able to, to build the presidential campaign uh, that I did and that later on President Biden appointed me in, to be confirmed, the first confirmed uh, cabinet secretary who was openly gay. It wasn't about what I was able to get done, but the fact that uh, part of what my service and, um, and campaign meant to people only existed because of that very thing that I thought would make it all impossible. The very thing I thought would multiply all of any hopes I had about public service on a large scale, thought I would, it would multiply all of that by zero, wound up being a really important part, unintended and not sought after, but very meaningful of what I had to offer. People would come up to me, sometimes still do, especially sometimes somebody from an older generation. I remember in an airport, one guy coming up to me and reached out to shake my hand and he didn't say a word, he couldn't say a word. Uh, there were tears in his eyes, but we had an entire conversation. Uh, I understood what he was saying about what my just being able to plausibly run meant for him. And I couldn't even imagine the amount of, of, of lived experience and fear and pain uh, behind the things that he was saying just by shaking my hands and looking me in the eye. And that happens, some version of that happened a thousand times over on the campaign. And so even though I didn't think my public service was about that, I don't. I mean, my public service at the moment is about transportation policy. I know that the very thing that I once thought would have made it, me ineligible to do this kind of service has actually become part of what I have to offer. And so look for ways in which what feels like your biggest obstacle might not only be an obstacle you will overcome, uh, but very much a part of the impact that you are going to make. Amen. That's absolutely the case. You know, we have students from all over the world and they're here because they want to be change makers. Uh, they want to be trailblazers. They want to make a difference, uh, solving problems, uh, both personally and professionally, and in many cases, even politically. Uh, so when I think about uh, what they are going to be going through in the years ahead, um, as, a, as a leader, uh, what excites you to get up in the morning and get to work? And what is the biggest worry that you have mm. uh, about 
our country and the world uh, in terms of the challenges that we face? Mm. Um, well, usually the thing getting me up in the morning now is uh, our toddlers uh, who uh, have <laughs> no respect for our desire or need for sleep. Um, but also, of course, in a grander sense, that propels you. I mean, we, you know, we, we have uh, twin 18-month-olds, uh, and, and that really makes you take the future more seriously than ever. Um, what I'm really propelled by is a knowledge that we're in this moment, kind of both of the halves of your question, actually, the, the opportunity in front of us. Uh, the reason I, I believe for all the challenges we're dealing with in, in transportation right now, this is the best job in the federal government, which is that we're, we're, we're building the future, like, literally building what America's future is going to look like, and with that building livelihoods and building American competitiveness and American success, uh, and contributing, I think, to the world's success in, in confronting global challenges like climate. Um, but also the, the ferocious challenges that, that do face us. Um, this divisiveness that has made it so difficult to get even manifestly good things done. And also, in our country, I think, the very real risk of stasis in our political institutions. The most elegant feature of the Constitution is that it contains the capacity to revise itself, the amendment process which has been used on average about once a decade over the history of our country, but hasn't really been touched in a meaningful way in half a century. And I use that as just one example of the, the need for our country to be ready to refresh itself in terms of our institutions, in terms of our toolkit for making policy, for making law, and for, for meeting the moment, because the moment is like, Nothing we've seen before. Again, whether it's in my particular slice of it, the transportation portfolio, and everything that, that, that we are about to face from, uh, I, I keep mentioning the climate challenge, but technological developments like artificial intelligence whose implications for transportation we're only just beginning to understand. Um, all the way through to the geostrategic concerns that, that, that I think shape the way the US uh, interacts with the rest of the world. Um, it is going to require us to have a level of imagination that I'm not sure even now we, 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 we fully acknowledge or admit or recognize. Uh, and so much will depend on whether we do, because I, I think that it will be decided, largely in this very decade, whether we successfully meet those challenges or whether we get to the middle of the century and uh, instead of my kids kind of being small enough to, uh, uh, to, to sit in our lap and, and try to read Goodnight Moon, they'll be sitting across the table uh, over a meal saying, Dad, wh why didn't you do more? Mm -hmm. why, why didn't you capture that moment? That's what really yeah. keeps yeah. me going. Well, I think that's a, a really um, important point because young people have so much power and a lot of it is unused. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in your life, in your late teens, your early 20s, you know, many distractions, all kinds of, you know, worries and wonders about your own life and the path forward. But the young people of the world on every continent actually hold the balance of political power to decide whether or not people will make the decisions that will shape the future. So in the remaining two minutes, Pete, give us you know, a call to action uh, that would especially connect with young people, literally from 92 countries, who have much more power than they sometimes understand and certainly that they utilize. Mm. What a great note to end on. And uh, I, I agree with you. That's where so much power lies. That's, uh, where some of our most important decisions are going to come down to is whether young people mobilize to shape our future for the better. I'll, I'll use an example that is more specific to, to my field of U.S. transportation policy, but then I'll, I'll suggest why it's important writ large. Um, as I mentioned, I'm very proud of this $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill, about half of which is in transportation with funds uh, that are moving through my department out around the country on everything like the airport in Nashville that we celebrated uh, improvements at today to, to ports uh, that are going to help us with our supply chains. 
But what's interesting is most of those dollars actually go into the hands of uh, cities or counties or states that are coming up with the actual projects. We're just funding them. We're helping. We're, we're doing everything we can to help with the delivery, but we're not thinking up the projects in Washington. The ideas aren't all coming from Washington. The funding is. And so if you really wanted to shape what was going on with this giant national trillion dollar bill, the best thing you could do is to be present where a decision is being made closer to home, like a city council meeting or a state legislative process where these decisions really cash out. And young people have an enormously important voice in that. I have seen myself, back when I was mayor, uh, I've seen votes on our city council go differently just because a handful of students, one by one, got up and took the mic during the portion of the meeting that was dedicated to public comment, changed the way everybody thought about things. You didn't hear, they, some of them weren't even old enough to vote. They had something else, and this is what I really want to leave you with. Whether you were at a planning board meeting in a community near you, weighing in on an infrastructure project, or participating in an educational, the governance of an educational institution through a, a student body, uh, and, and you're in a, uh, any country in the world, there is a level of moral authority that you have uh, that is an enormous advantage in being heard. I know all the reasons you're conscious of the disadvantages of being heard or trying to be heard that come with being young and trying to be taken seriously. But the other side of the coin is a moral authority that comes from being able to look into the eyes of the people who are making the decisions that will shape your lives. At my tender age of 41, I just noticed during this interaction that I have aged into the process where when I talk about why climate change matters so much, I'm doing it more in terms of my children's future than my own. Um, it's part of the process of growing older, I guess. Um, but you're able to ask people whether they are doing right by you. And since so many of the decisions, good or bad, that are being made right now really come down to whether we would uh, sacrifice the long term to do what's right, for some kind of short-term expediency, whether that short-term expediency is profit, or whether it's political reward, or whether it's clicks. You are walking ambassadors of the long-term, of the future. And when you ask those questions, they rate a very serious answer. So I hope you will deploy that uh, extraordinary moral authority, which amounts to a kind of power whenever a decision is being made that affects your future. Perfect. Thank you so much, Secretary Buttigieg. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll go off this right. way. Thanks, That's everybody. That was perfect. Hi, I'm Alex Tarzikan, human rights lawyer, refugee rights advocate, founder of the Meet a Refugee Instagram page and CGIU commitment mentor. I've participated in CGIU twice in the past, but today I'm here to tell you about my most recent initiative. I'm from Aleppo, Syria, a country that has come back in the headlines. As some of you already know, a devastating earthquake hit Turkey and Syria on February 6, 2023 killing 45,000 individuals in both countries and leaving over 5.3 million people homeless in Syria, displaced possibly for a second or third time since the start of the civil war in 2011. 12 years of conflict in Syria had left me and my friends from back home disempowered, unmotivated, and less engaged in the cause. When the earthquake happened, we had two options, either remain numb or do something about it. Aid delivery in Syria has become very politicized. In an effort to put humanity first, we decided to come together and create Syria Spora, a network of Syrians scattered around the world who aim to use our knowledge, resources, and networks to ensure better coordination of fundraising opportunities and efforts for Syria identify channels of support to Syria and reliable organizations working on the ground, and create a better understanding of the needs of Syrians on the ground, be it housing, mental health support, or other long-term needs. Our goals are to reconnect with one another, re-engage on Syria, and mend the divisions that were created as a result of the war. 
In the face of this disaster within a disaster, we want to come together and offer support to those who are working tirelessly on the ground. We invite you to join our movement as the earthquake is a powerful reminder of how natural disasters can affect anyone, anywhere. Help us offer support to those who need our help the most. Please welcome the Vice Chair of the Clinton Foundation, Dr. Chelsea Clinton. Um, thank you all so much for that um, very warm and enthusiastic uh, welcome. I want to echo uh, my parents' gratitude to Vanderbilt and particularly to all the students here who are welcoming our CGIU uh, community with so much uh, enthusiasm and hospitality. Thank you. Um, there's been lots of discussion about uh, all of the wind um, and how it's affected already, as you chuckle, uh, your experiences here. And I just uh, want to take a moment to also thank all of the public health and safety officers, the first responders, um, everyone who ensured the airport could reopen safely, uh, that the debris was cleared up, everyone who works with the sanitation department. Can we please give uh, all of the people I mentioned and those I didn't, a big round of applause for helping us uh, be together safely today. I'm really uh, excited about our next conversation and so I just want to uh, hopefully not too awkwardly segue into it and ask our extraordinary panelists to join me on stage. So first, uh, could we please have Olivia Juliana, the Director of Politics and Government Affairs, G Gen Z for Change. And yeah, oh yeah, please feel free to applaud for each of them individually. They certainly deserve it. Oh gosh, they're coming out in a different order than I had on my card. So first, actually, we have Jordan Reeves, the co-founder of Design With Us, and then we have Olivia. Next, we have Sukhmit Singh Satchel, who's a medical student, a CGIU 21 alum, a health activist, social entrepreneur, and founder, Seek Health Foundation. And certainly, uh, last but not least, uh, we have um, Georgina Pascugan, author, ballerina uh, with New York City Ballet. So thank you all for being with us. Um, you know, and I think um, I expected uh, a different order, so I apologize for that slight scramble. Do you want us to switch chairs? No, I think we're good. I'm pretty adaptable. Okay. <laughs> You know, my life may have had some upheaval in it at different points in time. So uh, kind of uh, resilience and uh, changeability are uh, well, uh, well-worn well life skills. Um, but Jordan, since you are sitting next to me, you know, I'll start uh, with you. Um, you know, when you were in fifth grade, uh, you wrote a book and you became an inventor and yes. you did all sorts of extraordinary things um, when you were 10. And so I wonder if you can talk a little bit about even some of those extraordinary things you did as a child, and how that experience when you were younger than uh, even um, those of you on the stage or those of you with us in the audience um, kind of shaped what you wanted to do with your life. Um, I think my whole career in design and just speaking my mind on what I believe in started in a very humble way. I invented a prosthetic arm because if you have not noticed, I have one hand. Wow. <laughs> and um, I was taking this difference that I have and creating off of it, and I didn't expect anything. I created a prosthetic arm that shoots glitter. Very 10-year-old of me. Still like glitter, it's great. <laughs> Wait till you become a parent, and then you may have a slightly different view of glitter. Those of you that are parents are clearly the ones chuckling. When we do crafts in our house that have glitter, it stays in our home for months. I find it as I vacuum and I clean, even embedded in my children's hair. It's After just like a friend. Showers. Is it? I don't know. We might have to respectfully disagree. Sorry, back to your invention. You invented a prosthetic arm that shoots glitter yes and it picked up traction and it did things that i never expected it to ever do um it made a mindset on disability that i hadn't really ever seen before because usually when people hear about disabilities they think oh that's so sad and that sucks for them 
when it's not a sad thing and there's just like so little information about people with disabilities and there are so many people that have disabilities in the world. I mean, we're all going to grow old and get disabilities with age and it's just not very normalized when it should be. And that's what the, my invention was able to do. And so how did that experience now affect uh, what you do today with design more broadly? Yes, um, I think uh, I still have, like in my day-to-day -day life, I have this design mindset that I am able to realize. Um, I, it came with me being born with a disability. Um, I always had to figure out how to do things in a specific way, like tying my shoes. And those were all the things that built to the mindset I have today. And I've been able to grow confidence in being able to speak out for my community. And really just, I've, I've grown a platform which is very lucky to have. Uh, platforms can be a really big thing to get you places. And I, it's, it's been amazing to be able to speak out for want of inclusivity. You know, I think, um, Jordan, that's a good segue to Olivia, who used a platform rather um, notoriously now uh, to raise more than $2 million within a week, I think. Is that right? Within a week for uh, reproductive rights and abortion access. Um, so uh, I would rather you tell that story than me. Um, can you share a little bit of the detail that I've uh, purposely glossed over? Um, and share kind of how and why uh, so much of your work now as a Gen Z activist focuses on reproductive rights and access. Absolutely. Um, I, I grew up in rural Texas, and when I was 12 years old, I was diagnosed with polycystic ovarian syndrome. And the doctor, who was an emergency room doctor seeing me because I was one of the millions of Texans who did not have health insurance, and was able to go to the doctor as a last resort of my parents willing to take on the medical debt they knew they would be taking on by taking me to the hospital. Uh, the doctor was an older white man who told me my symptoms were my fault and that my parents had not done a good enough job of making me be a young, active child. Um, by the age of 14, I had had just about every medical exam you could think of, blood work, gynecological exams, and uh, I was put on birth control to regulate my diagnosis. And it was a horrible experience all around because I did not consent to a lot of the medical procedures and tests that I had had done. It was very invasive and very uncomfortable. Um, and ever since then, I have been very passionate about reproductive health care, even into the fact that I had to drive an hour and a half to get to a pediatric gynecologist to get treatment for the disease that I had. Um, and so as a young woman growing up in rural Texas and seeing these issues, um, I very quickly became very passionate about the pro-choice movement, despite growing up in a conservative, religious, pro-life home. And it wasn't until um, the summer of 2021, the Texas state legislator passed the civil bounty law known as the abortion ban. And abortion essentially became banned in the state of Texas. And following that, this organization, Texas Right to Life, put out a tip line where they were asking people to report medical professionals and people who assisted in abortion access. Um, now, I grew up on social media. At this point, I was a TikToker who made political videos about why young people should be involved. And I asked other young people to send fake tips to that tip line, and within three days, we had completely taken it down. And so from there, I had been embraced by the reproductive justice community, and I became an abortion rights activist in a post-row Texas. But the reality is, Texas had been post-row for a very long time. Um, and with that sentiment, I had the displeasure of listening to Congressman Matt Gates 
speak at the Turning Point USA Student Action Summit where he gave a very disgusting misogynistic description of what he believed an abortion rights activist to be. Um, and I responded publicly. I said, I'm not 5'2", I'm actually 5'11", 6'4", in heels, so I can remind small men like you of their place. And Uh, and apparently he did not like that response because his reaction was to tweet out my photo quoting a Newsmax article saying that his comments were sure to raise the dander of his political adversaries. And he tweeted my photo with the caption, dander raised, in an attempt to have his 1.4 million followers body shame a 19-year-old girl on social media. Unfortunately for him, he picked the wrong one. <laughs> because my response was to immediately use my platform to start fundraising for the Gen Z for Choice abortion funds, which spanned 50 abortion funds across the country. And within 24 hours, we had raised $100,000. And I sent him a thank you card on Twitter. <laughs> I, I signed it off. I said, get wrecked. And then... It went from 100,000 to 500,000 to a million dollars. We had a million dollars in three days. And there was this media frenzy of TV appearances and press appearances, and in 24 hours, we raised an additional million dollars. And to this day, we raised over $2.3 million. Um, and the very fun conclusion to the Matt Gates story is that I recently attended the State of the Union as an invited guest of Congresswoman Nanette Barragan, and I actually came face to face with Matt Gates backstage. <laughs> and I called him over and he walked over, very much not knowing who I was at the moment, and I put my hand out and he grabbed my hand and shook my hand and I said, I just wanted to say thank you for helping me raise $2 million for abortion funds. To which he quickly dropped my hand and said, heard you had trouble spending it, and started walking down the hallway where I yelled at him, pretty sure I have more integrity than you do. As members of Congress, including Senator Warnock, got to see me yell at Matt Gates as he walked away. Uh, well, I have a feeling that actually may not be the conclusion of the story, so I look forward to the next chapter. Um, and Sukhmeet, I, I want to turn to you now um, to talk about a different challenge of access. I know, you know in the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic, you, know, you really focused on ensuring there was kind of good information and then later you know, vaccines to the indigenous and native communities you know, in, in Canada, where you're from. I wonder if you could share kind of why that became kind of your motivating kind of purpose and way to engage and serve you know, during, uh, during the kind of early days in the depths of the COVID-19 pandemic. And you know, a similar question, how has that experience now shaped kind of where you plan to go in the future? Thank you so much, first of all, for having me here. I was one of the people in the audience a few years ago, and so it's a huge honor to be here today. I just wanna say, following up conversations like this, you know, it's important to have conversations that are open, honest, and really get people involved. And so when COVID first started, I noticed a lot of the world was really not paying attention to the indigenous populations. Despite the fact, COVID rates were the highest in indigenous communities. And so I knew that I had to do something about it. And so I kid you not, one day I was on Facebook and I met this wonderful person, Victor, who's a medical student at Harvard. We don't know each other from before. I just saw him and I'm like, hey, I love the work that you do for indigenous communities. I would love to see if we can collaborate and do something. And so we started something called Translations for Our Nations. Now this is something that became quite rapid and really helped get a lot of indigenous peoples access to COVID-19 information that they needed. And within a month, we had over 50 translators from around the world who were indigenous. 
and we helped reach over 250,000 indigenous peoples around the world with this COVID-19 information. Now this information, thank you. This information was all in indigenous languages. And I think that is what we're missing in today's society in healthcare. Now being a medical student right now, I remember when COVID first started, I was a first year medical student and now I'll be graduating in within I think a month or so from medical school. So the time has just flew by. But in these four years, what I learned was that it's so important for us to have culturally effective information out there so that when someone goes to their doctor, someone goes to their surgeon, they have the resources to help these individuals understand them from the cultural context, from their physical health, from their emotional health, from their spiritual health. So that way we can really allow for holistic health. And you know, you asked my plans for the future. So March 22nd, I find out where I match. So uh, hopefully good news there, but you know, I am applying for plastic and reconstructive surgery. And this is something that is very difficult to get into in Canada. There's only about 24 spots. And ca Canada already has very limited seats for individuals. And so for someone who looks like me as well, there's not been a single person in Canada who looks like me who will be a plastic surgeon. So that's what I want to do, and that's what I want to change. Um, you know, speaking of change, uh, Georgina, I know you have um, given an enormous amount of your you know, time, energy, talent, kind of grit to changing the face and the understanding of what ballet is. Um, and I'm sure that that commitment is partly kind of why you're known as the rogue ballerina. Can you talk a little bit about um, kind of when you decided that your ballet career wasn't just going to be kind of you dancing on the stage, but needed to have kind of even more of a purpose uh, and where the rogue ballerina moniker comes from? Um, of course I can. And thank you for having me. I just need to send this out there that I would rather be doing a full length show, 32 fuertes on the stage, than speaking. I'm very scared of crowds. <laughs> um, but I'm here. And um, the rogue ballerina, my moniker, I am so fortunate to be able to get to do what I love for a living. I want to acknowledge that privilege. And it was through this, um, I never was made aware of how different I was and how I did not fit into any boxes. You look at me, I'm not what you think of as the quintessential idea of a classical ballerina. Um, and I was made aware by every, almost every single teacher, especially when I got into the, the New York City Ballet. All of a sudden, I was being told, you know, your body's not thin enough. You have the wrong body type. You have the wrong demeanor. You have the wrong ambition. You should be quiet. You should be um, demure. And... I was really struggling to fit in, and this was very odd because I was at the top of my game at the School of American Ballet. I had risen through the ranks. I got this amazing apprenticeship, that, living this dream job. And all of a sudden, this dream became this huge challenge for me. I did not fit in, and all, I, so all of a sudden, I looked around, and I was the only person that looked like me. I'm mixed race, Filipino-American, and I woke up one morning when I had the first inklings of uh, telling my story. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to embrace me. I'm going to take all of these attributes that are being told to me that are wrong and will be strikes against my character and maybe not even allow me to excel in this chosen career. And I'm going to embrace them and I'm gonna embrace them as the thing that sets me apart. And thus, the rogue ballerina was born. We think about the word rogue in a negative connotation, but to me, rogue means embracing what is different, embracing not being the norm, and taking it from there. You know, I, I'm also, um, you know, so struck listening um, to all of you that 
uh, none of you embraced you know, the boxes that you were expected to stay uh, within. And I do think something um, that I, I chafe at uh, is when any of us are told to stay in our lanes. I'm like, when did you get to decide what lane I belong in? Except if I'm driving, you can tell me to stay in my lane. But otherwise, um, like otherwise, no. So Jordan, I wonder, you know, again, starting with you, um, how has the disability rights kind of movement changed uh, since you uh, courageously, although maybe since you were in fifth grade, um, where as I have a, a girl who will soon be there, uh, I don't think thankfully she's scared of anything yet. And I think one of my roles as a parent is to try to keep that fearlessness alive for her and her brothers. Um, you know, I'm curious though, you know, from then till now, how has the movement changed? What else do you think needs to change? And what do you want from everyone here? Not just what do you want them to know, but what do you want from them? Um, I, I grew up, um, I wasn't quite aware, and I don't think anyone ar around me was aware, other than like my brother's friends that I was different. And when that realization came to me, because my parents never treated me any different, as they should. <laughs> and um, when I realized that I was treated differently than others, I wanted to prove them wrong. So I did every activity possible I did piano, I did ballet. <laughs> I did all sorts of dance styles. Um, I did basketball, I did baseball and softball. I did everything just to prove that I could do it. And I think it has driven me to live a very fulfilled life that I, I'm not looking back and I'm like, dang, I wish I would have done this and tried this. And now I'm able to be able to truly find my passions, which are currently in the arts. I, I find the arts just beautiful. <laughs> and I, I'm making these realizations from my experience with um, being so involved in the disability community that I can combine the two. And I've come across recently that there's not good representation in the media of disabilities and any sh we're, we're making strides and it's important to make those stories and have people with disabilities just be humans in stories. It doesn't have to be all about them having a disability. And also have, when there's a dis disabled character in something, have the actor actually have the disability. Because <laughs> there are enough people to cast. And people with missing limbs don't always have to be villains. <laughs> but um, I'm really finding joy and love in acting and realizing that if I went into that field, I could be a part of that change. And I think that's very cool. I agree. Um, I had a friend who um, studies at media for a living once tell me, you knew there was real representation when we stopped talking about representation. Um, you know, Olivia, you are you know, in the trenches of the abortion rights and access fight in this country, which unfor unfortunately very much is a fight. And your experience um, with Matt Gates is uh, not the only hostility that you've encountered you know, online or in real life. Um, many of the students here at CGIU, because of what they're doing, will also, or have also, already experienced quite a bit of pushback, of being told 
this isn't important, this isn't worthy of your ambition, or you're not good enough to do this, why do you care so much, um, stay in your lane, sit down, be quiet. Um, what advice do you have for the students about how to stay kind of true to yourself and not get polluted by the kind of meanness and the vitriol um, and to know kind of when to, when to stand up and, and fight because it's the right answer and when that fight isn't worth it and your energy is better directed somewhere else. Would an old white man ever question if he deserves to be in the position that you're in? He wouldn't. Would, would yeah. It's the truth. Um, you know, a year ago, I didn't have a bank account. I didn't have an ID. I was a community college student who the only reason I was able to go to school was because of the American Rescue Plan. And to have grown up in that kind of environment as working class, single parent household all through high school and being a Latin woman in Texas in the reproductive healthcare space um, and being an openly queer Latin woman in the reproductive healthcare space. Um, I, I started getting death threats when I was 17, just being totally honest. And to this day, I still get attacks not only on me, but you know, my, my, my sisters have had to go to their children's school to say, if people come here asking for my kids, don't give them to them because this is, what my, this is my sister and this is what she does. Um, and honestly, I think that the thing that motivates me the most to keep going is all of the institutional things I've faced in my life, all of the barriers that I've had to overcome, I would be doing a disservice to all of the activists and organizers and revolutionaries who have come before me if I steered away from a fight simply because people were afraid of the possibilities of what I was doing. And that should stay the same for all of you. Uh, and you shouldn't be afraid to make a difference. You shouldn't be afraid to fight for what you believe in or to lead with your identity forward because the reality is, I believe there are more good people in the world than there are bad. And what you're doing, the projects you're doing, the initiatives you're leading, you could help more people than you could ever imagine. But if you give up because other people don't want you to live your truth or live your dream, then you're doing a disservice not just to the people who have come before you, but to the people who will potentially have to face those barriers after because you decided to give up. And I think that we owe it to the people of the past and the next generation of leaders to help pave the way for them and not just be complicit in systems of oppression or barriers that are in place right now. Um, yeah. So we, you, you talked about being in the audience a few years ago. Um, I wonder if you could kind of share um, your experience having been a CGIU student and kind of what being part of this community has meant to you um, and what you would want anyone here uh, to know about, about your journey over the last few years come from, from there to here. Yeah, so I was in the virtual audience, so you guys are lucky that you get to be in person, so I'm jealous. But when I joined the CGIU community, I was one of 38 people who received the COVID-19 grant. And this funding literally changed my life. I was able to implement projects within my local community, the sick community in Surrey, BC, Canada. And this project went on to help over 250,000 people just that initial funding. And now when I wanted to start this project when COVID started, a lot of people were looking at me side-eyed, like they're like, this is not gonna work. You know, you want to go into sick houses of worship, you wanna go into religious places, and you wanna educate people about COVID in their own language? Like that sounds crazy to them. And I'm just like, okay, wait and watch. No one gave me funding initially. And then when CGIU selected me as one of 38 people and one of two Canadians, it totally changed the project. I had now enough funding to help protect my volunteers, recruit over 150 volunteers uh, to make this project happen. 
I had people from across Canada reaching out to me, being like, how can I get involved? I even had people in the US reach out, being like, this is such a cool model. Can we utilize this model in our communities? All the way to Kenya and Africa, in Africa, to India, all these different places reaching out to me. And now since CGIU, I've been invited to speak in Germany at the One Young World Conference as a keynote speaker. I was invited in September by Bill Gates to speak at his event in New York. Like these are things I would have never imagined I would have ever done when I was just in the audience. And it really takes me back to my childhood. I was an immigrant from India, moved in 2002 when I was seven years old. And when I moved to Canada, you know, my parents told me it's for a better life. But that's not what I noticed when I moved. I was bullied heavily for the way that I looked, for the food that I ate, my speech, all these different things that I couldn't control. And so I knew I had to continue to work on myself. I was put into ESL. And any time any opportunity came up in elementary school to be like, hey, do you want to represent the class at a school assembly? I would always be the first one putting my hand up while knowing people are making fun of me. You know, they're not laughing at what I'm saying, they're laughing at me. And that was something I was okay with because I knew I had to be better. I knew what I had within me, and I had a grade three principal, Mr. Rogers, who I still talk till today. His and name was Mr. Rogers? Yeah, literally, <laughs> Mr. Rogers. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> and he told me, he's like, you know what, Sukhmeet, you have the power within you, I can just see it to change the world one day. And how would I have ever imagined that I would be, you know, speaking with you, speaking with all you wonderful people, got to meet President Bill Clinton backstage, talked about Sikh history, about how he's been a huge proponent for Sikhs in America, which right now the 2021 FBI report just stated Sikh um, hate crimes are the highest in proportion to the population in the U.S., which is shocking. I come from Canada. I don't see a lot of that. And now, being in America right now, I truly, to be honest, I was scared to come here. I was telling my co-panelists here, I was like, I don't want to get shot, you know? I literally had these things in my head. But being on stages like this, being represented, I hope that, you know, other youth out there that look like me, whether you wear a turban or not, whether you wear a hijab or not, whether you wear a kippah or not, you are important, you matter, don't let anyone ever say no to you. And if you ever need someone to back you up, I'm always in your corner. Oh, me. thank you. Um, Jordini, I know you said earlier that you would rather do 32 uh, fuetes on the, on the stage than have to speak publicly. Um, I'm just jealous because I could never do more than six or maybe eight. Um, I certainly never got close to 32. Um, you shared earlier about how you, you know, started to stand up for yourself uh, in a really powerful and profound way. I also know, though, that you have stood up for others who uh, may not fit the kind of conventional, stereotypical, in every possible meaning of the word, um, you know, idea, not ideal, but idea, of a ballet dancer. Um, how have you pushed yourself out of your comfort zone to do that, um, to be able to help support others you know, in ballet and, and dance um, who also know that they deserve uh, to be there? And how has that shaped what you want to do on stage and off? Well, um, in 2017, I co-founded with my partner in change, Phil Chan, who's not here tonight, but I have to give him his acknowledgement, um, Final Bow for Yellowface. And this has now become a global initiative that seeks to um, eliminate outdated and offensive stereotypes of Asians on stage. Believe it or not, in 2017, only five years ago, yellow face was predominantly used on our stages in operas, in ballets. Um, yellow face equates to black face. Um, some operas still use black face. Um, and so 
I had advocated for myself to be on one of the first diversity panels in New York City Ballet. And I was I actually had taken a leave of absence. I was doing the musical Cats. Don't ask me why. You can. <laughs> it was a great time. Um, but they uh, made this group, and I realized that my name wasn't on it. I knew I was one of the only Asian American females in the ballet. Um, and so I sent an email, and I advocated for a spot. And they initially told me, you know, like we weren't really planning to have all, you know, ev it's, you know, we want, don't want everyone, you know, represented. Um, and so I was like, what? Um, and then dropped it um, because I was busy doing cats. Um, but then in the fall, when I came back, I got an email from um, my then, my former boss, Peter Martins, um, his secretary saying that actually after further thought, we would like to ask you to join this panel because we know you will tell us the truth. And so I was really happy with advocating for myself. I got on this, this panel. We were talking about representation on stage. We were talking about one, um, well, who here has seen a ballet? Oh, I love this. This is great. Love it. So who's here, who here has seen the Nutcracker? Excellent. So uh, for those who haven't, the second act is basically a tour around the wor world. And there was one specific divertissement in the second act of Nutcracker, the Chinese divertissement, that was so offensive in its portrayal of Asian culture. I mean, at City Ballet, and I myself have been guilty of doing yellow face. Um, I, when I was you know, 18, I was cast in this role, and it's principal casting, and I'm in this company already feeling like I don't belong, and then all of a sudden I'm on, I'm out as a featured dancer, and I didn't have the wherewithal on myself to speak up how, how awkward I was feeling being dressed as a, essentially an Asian woman, but wearing, it's a Chinese divertissement, a geisha Japanese wig, and then the, the lead male gets rolled out in a box. He's T, we get it, T comes out of a box. Um, and he is portrayed as this, every, every divertissement in the Nutcracker comes from some sort of nobility, except for the Chinese principal. He comes out with a rice paddy hat and a Fu Manchu, complete with Q hairstyle, which was imposed violently during the, the Qing Dynasty. And I found myself having to do this performance over and over and over again. At New York City Ballet, we have one of the longest runs of Nutcracker, 46 shows. And so I ended up I couldn't take the dance seriously. I mean, I was doing the steps, but my, my co-partner my, uh, on stage, we would just make everything bigger. And it got to the point where like, soon all of my company mates were like, what's Georgina gonna do tonight on stage? We'd have balancing contests, out jump each other, all to the point where um, our rehearsal director finally came back and was like, Georgina, nobody is watching this <laughs> lead man anymore. You've stolen the complete show. And I didn't realize, it took all this process through this diversity work in myself and learning how I have contributed to um, uh, the status quo and being like, this was my rebellion. I did not have the chance to have a voice in this particular job. Um, I would just be replaced by another woman. And this was my chance if I wanted to become a soloist because I wanted to step out, I had to do this role, but I was making a caricature out of a caricature. And so we had this discussion with my then boss and I advocated for this change to remove these offensive um, portions of this dance. And because I'm not of Chinese heritage, I quickly left that meeting and called up Phil Chan and was like, hey, I'm pretty sure Peter Martins is gonna give you a call, but I gotta go to rehearsal. See you later, bye. Uh, and sure enough, to Peter's credit, and I do have to give him credit there, he, removed the offensive wigs. Now the lead gentleman wears a nobleman's hat that is much more fair and just appropriate and correct representation of Asian heritage. It's no longer a Chinese monolith. It is very much specific to Chinese culture. And at that moment, you know, I was suffering from a major injury, so I wasn't dancing. I went and watched the show and I was just teared up and was sobbing. And then I turned to Phil and I was like, if we can make this change here, 
with George Balanchine's Nutcracker. Why don't we aim higher? And so we bought a website for $11. We created a pledge. And we did grassroots efforts through our connected network. And we reached out saying, like, we, we want to inspire conversations about how you represent your cultures in your Nutcracker Ballet. And now it's become a globally known initiative. I mean, the Paris Opera Ballet in 2021 cited Final Bow for Yellow Face as its deciding contributing factor to eliminate its use of black face and yellow face, not only on its ballet stages, but on its opera stages as well. Well, thank you um, to all of our panelists for sharing your stories, for sharing actually even just kind of small fragments of your stories and the big ways in which you have made changes um, throughout your life and will continue to make changes throughout your lives. And I hope um, everyone here is as inspired as I am, um, even if Jordan and I are still gonna maybe have a difference of opinion <laughs> on glitter. Um, you're clearly never too young, though, to do something kind of bold, boldly different, uh, boldly uh, important, and also kind of to shatter a stereotype. And you also may never know where what you start kind of may have an impact. I think when Georgina started trying to change kind of what the Nutcracker looked like, you know, on the New York City Ballet stage, she probably had no idea uh, that she kind of could and would and will continue to change the face of, kind of the live arts around the world. Um, and while she says she's shy, she's thankfully certainly not timid. And Sukhmeet clearly is only just getting started. I know we all wish him the best for his match um, and certainly hope that he is the first and know he won't be the last Seek plastic and reconstructive surgeon in Canada. Um, also, clearly, um, hope that you continue to have a safe time in the United States and come back. We do have challenges here that you don't have on your side of the border, but we also have clearly a lot of fierce and incredible people, including the three women you're sitting with on the stage who refuse to accept the status quo. And Olivia, thank you for not giving up on Texas or the United States. Um, and for so bravely sharing your story um, because no 12 or 14 year old or someone who's 102 should ever be touched or treated without their consent and everyone should have access to the healthcare that they determine is right for themselves. <laughs> and to and support media that has full and dignified and honest representation of people with disabilities and I hope that we all will be seeing you on a stage or in a theater soon. Thank you all so much. We will see you tomorrow morning. Thank you.